Thanks for the second catch. I mean, Hi, Ron. Thanks for having me in the right weather. Hopefully, some people uh, on YouTube can see. So, my name is James Gap. I'm the curator of the Wisdom for this survey at the USA Travels or number one one seven survey. Um, this is Elizabeth Bull and Ian Lewis. Um, I'd like to start today by acknowledging that we're meeting today on unceded tangible and digital land. Pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Um, I'd also like to um, express our heartfelt thoughts on the people in Ukraine during this very difficult time and to anybody that's here to their family and friends as well. Um, this talk accompanies Cordy's survey, as I said. Um, the exhibition runs until the 10th of April, so please get down to see it. Really fantastic show, at least for myself. Um, and um, all thanks to Jose De Silva, who's the director of the Women's Heavy Galleries, um, to Catherine Woolley. Um, and the whole team at the NSW Galleries for all their support, and also to the commissioners so that will help to commission the whole project. It's been really great thing to work on. Um, today, I'll be speaking with Pauli and um, Millis about the development of strategies for practice from conceptual art to post conceptual art. Um, Elizabeth Pauli is an artist and academic. Until 2002, a sense of art as decoration and commodity informed a decorative painting project. Or from 2002 until 2006, she focused on a relational practice. Her work was recently open to new media such as weaving, embroidery, and video. Recent exhibitions include the National and Australian Art at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Sydney in 2017, Unfinished Business Perspectives on Art and Feminism at ACA in 2017, The Conspiracy of Art by John Baudrillard at Sarah Gallery in 2018, and Bauhaus Now at Buxton and Temple in Melbourne in 2019. Um, all these represented by Sarah Quiddy Gallery in Sydney. Ian Millis is one of Australia's first conceptual artists. His early 1970s participatory work soon led to a practice based on the premise that artists' role is to generate cultural change rather than manufacture content for the art industry. He has since worked with many progressive social and political groups and mostly with audiences outside the art world, ranging from urban activism and unionism to innovative agriculture. He argues, that, he argues currently that the most culturally significant activities are not recognised as art, but are done by people who don't call themselves artists and will only be categorized as art in retrospect. So I'll jump into some of this um, conversation. Um, I'd like to start by asking Liz and Ian, um, uh, what were the objectives of conceptual art um, and how did they succeed or fail in your eyes? I'll start with Liz. Oh, yeah, what are you? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, let's start with Ian. <laughs> He's a conceptual artist. Like, I mean, that's why. I wanted to talk to you about it was because um, I think we need to hear from conceptual artists. So, yeah, you should go first. Yeah, I don't want to go first because I'm like, I want to ensure you be able to correct you. No, 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 it's, it's um, I spent my entire life correcting people, men or women, about conceptual art. Um, and it's one of those things about. Um, Australian art history in general, because the terms get thrown around with very little relationship to what they really meant originally. I, I, in fact, I tend to sort of describe everything after the mid 1970s as, as the conceptual you know, because it has all the mannerisms which derive from the you know, from the 10 years before that, you know, conceptual art, and yet it's entirely institutional and entirely conservative. In lots of ways, it doesn't actually break out of any of the pre existing structures. Whereas, what happened during that period from the 1960s, in from the mid 1960s, basically, um, which is that the mid 60s and 70s, is the classic period of conceptual art, is it grew out of um, social concerns, as much as simple artistic concerns. Um, and everything that was done was loaded with. Um, protests and disillusionment about the society, which had become clear because of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War, in a sense, was a complete breach of faith mm -hmm. by those in power. Yeah. And there was this generation, you know, basically, a baby for the generation that had grown up very idealistically, suddenly faced with, with this, you know. And, and 
to critique the development problem, we can critique the need of sort of institution, we can critique of all the aspects of mine as well. And that tied into a formal logic that was happening within the painting itself as well. And so bit by bit, both the structure of paintings, of the gallery system, of the entire cultural institutional framework were all dismantled. You know? And it was quite overwhelming in lots of ways. And the 80s, in a sense, became from the late 70s onwards into the 80s, were a sort of a terrible order where those institutions and, and that overall business model of art learned how to fight back, how to program the language of revolution and the language of criticism and just basically neuter it. So it didn't actually mean anything. You know? And so you ended up with, with things like consent component, you know, and, you know, which is just absurd to dream of doing things like that. But what appropriation is it for that? Matter? Because when you look back on it now, it looks less like an art movement and more like a way of just expanding the market. So you can sell the same paintings multiple times. You know, just done by different people. You know, I mean, so so there's that's the way that period played out. Now, inherent in it was this idea, which had gone on since early modernism or earlier, of art becoming part of daily life. Right? And a lot of the people who that, that was there it was talk about it endlessly, right? um, but it had a particular focus in the 60s because of people like Marshall McLuhan, who, who, by talking about all the technologies of media, and also by talking about the fact that you know some societies don't have a word for art, or don't have an idea of art, um, suddenly clarified a whole lot of that in various ways. And because what had happened before when people talked about it. They didn't talk about art going away or anything. They, they sort of meant more open access for people to make stuff, you know, more open access for the distribution of that. Whereas what started happening with conceptual art was the very idea of art became just bits um, in, in a whole range, a huge range of different ways from a whole lot of different angles. And as, as the very idea of it became important bits, um, you were sort of left standing there. With nothing, and a lot of people freaked out and retreated, including some of the biggest names involved in freaked out and retreated. So, some of the documentation became the art, you know, they, 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 they became ways of substituting other stuff. So, it was still there, so, uh, and very few people actually walked away from it entirely. But there was a subset of people who walked away from it entirely, and I suppose only that small subset. Um, with disastrous consequences for any normal art career in Australia or even any understanding for decades. Um, just to quickly go bounce off that theme, what are some of the um, uh, examples? Um, I mean, there's a rich oral history that exists in you, you know, and it's um, uh, what are some of the examples of ways that arts were looking to revolutionize um, or, or kind of insert these idealisms? What what happened? What happened was, uh, 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 I mean, there's another there's another sort of thing 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 coming. Which in the late seventies, AIDS came along. What you have got, in fact, they, they the activism around AIDS became the perfect example, but also in lots of ways the death knell for a lot of them, because a lot of the people who were involved in that activism were artists who come through that conceptual London and basically worked with this sort of activism and, um, you know, uh, uh, ADA, you know, ADA, you know, in support of, of medical programs and trying to raise the issue, you know, that I was basically being ignored by the society of medical system. And so there were a huge number of the best artists in that period were finding that, that age-related stuff. And then they go away. And so, there was a sort of weird, oblique problem building with that. For people like me, it meant I started thinking about what was culturally significant. And, and, and I, I, what, I, what I thought was, what did actually made Australian culture like this? And, and I ended up thinking, well, it was trade unions, it was media, and it was actually religion. And I'm not going to go into religion, but the trade unions and media 
have very much created the values of Australia. And so I think we've worked our ways of working in that sort of space with the trade unions. I think you've made a point to talk to you and so on, and let them get their guns to run the trade the media board. Um, and and built into that was the idea that not that I wanted to do pre-published or whatever, which a lot of my friends wanted to do. What I wanted to do was develop a communication system that was at least in some tiny way an alternative to the mass media communication system. And if there's going to be a work of art, was that communication system. Right? And so I think there are a lot of people like me that thought about that, but also because of the way things were at the time, we didn't know about each other. We only found out about each other in the early 2000s. And so you're looking here at the, at the dissemination of ideas? Yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and also helping organise and certain sorts of campaigns. Well, there's always political campaigns going on, but some are actually more important than others. You know? And it was a case of using those skills that you've learned as an artist to actually help them um, create and run those campaigns. And it's um same question. What are the, yeah, it's actually up to you, you know, um, what were those objectives and in your eyes, um, how did it fail? So, um, this this thing to Ian talk about it um, from his point of view. The whole political context, I, I know from Lucy the parts writing about <clears throat> the sexual moment, that was all very um, at the fore, political like protests and that sort of thing. And so, I'm aware of that, but I guess for my own practice, I don't really. Um, take that into account, I look at it pretty much purely from an art point of view um, as a bit of a problem of what to make as art rather than it, it's hard for me to link it to the broader social context because I made because I was a child then when that was happening. Yeah, so I really do come up at it from an art for art's sake perspective, I suppose. But the problem, so to me, conceptual art was. And we weren't going to talk about dematerialization. <laughs> it was a dematerialization of the art object that created a problem for future practitioners, um, like we said at the last talk, in relation to the institution or the institutional hold over what art is, what constitutes constitutes the definition of art. But um, and then the failure was the failure for conceptual arts to actually dematerialize art as a concept, and that leads us to where we are today. As a problem of our lives. Tagged in a microphone situation. Like this. Um, let's bounce off that idea a little bit more. So, what, what for you characterizes the, the, the post conceptual, this post conceptual time that we're working in then? Uh, what clarifies it? What characterizes it? What is it? Yeah. Um, Maybe you could say a return to order if you're going to be critical. Um, but it's, the main characteristic of the present sexual moment is a kind of a, for me, a, a challenge of how to practice. That's, that's how I would sum it up most in a way that's, say, radical or questioning or, for want of a better word, new, you know, yeah. um, how to challenge all those ideas, even novelty and um, radicality. So I for me it's a problem. Mm. I want to um I want to quote you which I know people love uh in one of your essays. Uh, you say your contemporary artist's sense of crisis um, that which contemporary artists must confront is founded on the conceptual movement's failure to escape the expectations of art as necessarily an object, consumable, viewable and collectible. Via the return of art as a concept to form and the subsequent re entombment within the institution. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I said it better then. So, uh, and so your end of art project, which is your current project, which have, uh, includes all of you, including writing, actually, so it's kind of theoretical yeah. approach as well, yeah. is, is this grappling with the problem of art's re entombment in the institution. It is, yeah. It kind of clarifies this idea of what the post conceptual moment represents for you or the problem that it represents. Represents for you. Um, not to labor too much on the point, but um, why is it a problem that um, uh, that art exists in objects or that they're um, uh, cared for by institutions? Um, it's not necessarily a problem, but um, I respect the um, motives of 
the conceptual movement. And I really feel a need to go back to honor those um, ideals. <clears throat> to me, that's really important. They get brushed over a bit in arts theorizing and in practice, like they've been forgotten. So I just, um, I guess that's the main problem of the institutionalization of art is that it, um, it's like it's been forgotten and, and maybe put in the too hard basket of that project, perhaps, of dematerializing art or escaping the institution. So it just feels like a bit of a lie, I guess, to rematerialize art or to, yeah, to, um, it's like we said, a return to order. It's, it's, it's a conservative turn. Sure. <laughs> the way I think that Ian's practice, um, and certainly the way Ian deals with this, is that uh, Ian, you're arguing that um, we shouldn't return, we shouldn't try to contain our ideas in these objects, um, that we should keep going out into the real world and, and use the skills of artists or use the thoughtfulness that artists bring to enterprise um, to um, elaborate on, criticize. Um, uh, the very wide world that exists out there that, that does not belong in our institutions. Um, and so uh, you're arguing that you uh, you want to see, and I'm quoting you here, um, artists to be agents of cultural change rather than manufacturers of art market novelties. Um, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit in response to this? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, actually, you know, going back to the next topic, I mean, I, I agree that it failed, actually. But, but, I think the failure is, is it failed and it didn't, right? It succeeded massively because, because the failure is that all of those institutions and things still exist that people still make work like that, you know, one sort or another, you know, most conservative work, there are people out there make orders and moves and, you know, you know, that's actually you care. It's all still there. But there's a real naivety on, certainly on my part, which is gone now, I'm much older, but about understanding how change works. Things just don't go out of existence because other things have happened. Change, things, the world continues with all of those things in it, including the changes that you have made. And often the things that you were acting against grow bigger, but what they do is they lose their cultural significance. And that's the point I'm starting to understand, I eventually started to understand. So, I mean, the example I often use was in Lithgow, where I lived to the parts of the line. We actually have an annual jousting competition. There's more jousting happens in the world than happened in the Middle Ages, right? And in the Middle Ages, it was the major cultural form, the most significant cultural form was jousting. Right? Uh, there's more of it than there ever was. And who takes the slightest notice of it is absolutely without significance whatsoever, except in the music sport. Now, exactly the same thing is happening to painting. Painting is becoming ubiquitous, you know, like in a way that never was. It's everywhere. It's mass, it is a, simply a mass produced product, you know. And those institutions have slowly been incorporated into larger neoliberal business models. So the MCA is not an art gallery. The MCA is the third biggest tourist attraction in New South Wales. Some people bridge walks. And so you shouldn't be comparing it to the art gallery in New South Wales. You should be comparing it to the Harbour Bridge Walk. You know, that's its significance, right? Um, and the same thing applies to things like the Annalies and all of that. that actually, and actually, and, and all of those things that we thought of as the art infrastructure, they're now more than dumped to gambling, money laundering, um, tourism, you know, they're more part of those things than they are to an essential cultural enterprise of understanding the world and recognizing how the world is changing and how we have to adapt to it and get a new understanding of it. Now, once upon a time, things like painting as the only visual media did that for us, but they don't do it anymore. That's that's the thing. So they still exist, but they exist in their zombie forms, which really had no meaning or significance. And that's that's what eventually I came to sort of realize and think about. The other but the other bit of that we're talking about it, it disappearing into daily life is it did disappear into daily life and that's why you have things like YouTube and you have Flickr and you know you have TikTok and you have all of these so like social media helped make this happen. 
people are generating their own visual culture on a massive scale. You don't know who most of these people are. Some of them you might, but you know, like, it's just being churned out. So, so again, culture production has a gone way, and it is now embedded in daily life in a way it never was. And people don't think it was hard, you know. And yet, you know, you'll get look well, what well, happened with TikTok. TikTok's a perfect example of that. Suddenly, all this sort of you know, Amazing numbers of very creative um, videos. Yeah, I think I just want to kind of go back on this point here because something that I'm really fascinated by is this idea of cultural significance. I'd like to know what you mean by that, at least. Um, I know you've touched on it briefly. And I'd also like to know was there a time in which art was culturally significant? And if you might be able to give, a, give an example sometime. If I if I say you use the term art. Yeah. By art, yeah. you mean painting. Yeah, sure. Don't you realize we're here painting this culture? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, well, actually, what I mean is preconceptual. Anything that existed that was thought about as. Look, the, the, I think the, I think you know the crutches have been kicked out from underneath the, the minute Kishon turned up. You know, like from that point on, the game was over, really. You know, which doesn't mean like so things keep going, but you know. Um, um, People have been and lost things. It's lost it, it lost its importance as a way of visualizing the world, but photography came along. That robbed it of one of its major reasons for existing. From that point on, it had to rely on being symbolic and you know, narrative, you know, literally almost in a way. Um, so 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 it's been a long downhill slide in, in that sort of way. Right? Uh, but on the other hand, it Remain as a form of philosophical discussion about the nature of the society and the nature of the world. And, and that probably continued right up to conceptual art came along because that's what conceptual art was. It was part of that discussion about materiality and, and, and um, the culture of the, the wider society and how it works and how its power structures worked and what things were valued and what weren't. And, a whole range of things like that, you know. Um, and etc. I played around with all of those things. Um, and as you said earlier, you know, I mean, that's, to my mind at least, um, institutions of art, especially collective institutions of art, can help serve as um, uh, living memories. You know, of see, see, it's right, what you said, that's what I still argue to this day. But the point about them is that if they go back to their, they're perfectly valid to their original. Conception as collecting and preserving and whatever. But you know, curators wanted to be more fashionable than that. You know? And in fact, most of them have ended up entrepreneur in new art styles. So they're always trying to find the next new art style and promote it. They're always trying to get the numbers through the door. You know, so they've got locked into social and funding systems and a whole bunch of things like that, which have put these priorities on which go away from their real priority, which should be. With the collecting and preservation of cultural artifacts of some sort or another. And, and obviously, analyzing with the display and stuff like that. The historical, you know, no problem with at all. Um, because there's something that's been enormously um, useful in your practice, and there's someone who's reflecting on modernism quite significantly. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, uh, your idea of the trajectory to the contemporary from the modern and how that's been? It's not sure practice, but at least thinking. Um, I guess I see the uh, modern period as a dealing with the end of our map, <clears throat> which is why I do my end of art project is to sort of go back to that idea. Because I guess art forms are seen as alive and generative, and this idea of the end isn't so prevalent in thinking about art anymore. It's a more positivist um, attitude, say, or, a, or an aesthetic um, approach towards modern art that can overlook the radicality or the sense of, you know, of anti-art that pervades the modern. And so I, similar to my attachment to the ideals of the conceptual movement, I'm very attached to that tradition of the modern that is self-reflexive, so pretty cool to what end I don't know, but it, that's where my interest in art lies. So I try to position my practice in relation to the modern project um, as, as I see it. 
So I think that's what I really in, in your practice and certainly things that you've written and what Ian has written as well is this um, this idea that as art is approaching life, um, that art is whatever artists are doing. Um, and also that perhaps as Solar Wind famously wrote in his paragraphs on conceptual art, the object is um, secondary, if not the boundary, to the idea. This is the this is the foundation for conceptual art. Um, and also, um, uh, Louise Bourgeois also comments on that um, this idea that once you transfer your idea or emotion into an object, the object is, is useful. So at least a token. And I often like thinking about art in, the, in those terms. I mean, if that's the case, then all art institutions are doing are moving these tokens around the world. Um, the point is self knowledge and, and share. Um, perhaps something that an institution will never be able to fully own or collect or, or, or disseminate with, with complete control. Um, in, in one of your essays, um, and I want to come back to this show that Charlotte Day curated called Art as a Bird, because I think it's an interesting tangent. But in an essay that you wrote for that exhibition, you quote the historian Ernst Gombrich, um, who says, There's no such thing as art, only artists. So I'm just wondering if both of you want to talk about this idea of the objects being perfunctory, what that means in terms of how they're collective consumed, um, and also the idea that artists, um, the idea of making art is about first performing the idea of being an artist. So it's interesting that Comfort was in the same thing in the 40s. Well, before. what did you mean when he said that? I think you probably meant exactly what you and I would think was, which was that, that, in a sense, the artworks are this detritus of a thought process, you know, that they, they're the working out of a thought process. You know, and so that, that's their only significance. You know, they, don't, they don't stand alone without being embedded in, a, in the whole world. That's, that, that's the way I interpret it anyway. I mean, it's, it's not sort a of thing that I totally agree with in lots of ways. I mean, I, I do think that, that they're virtual categories that you just assign them afterwards. You know, it's a bit like calling yourself an artist, it's a bit like calling yourself a genius, it's asking for trouble. You know, basically, you know, like it's for something that's for others to decide later on, you know, once your, once your importance has been assessed. You know. But then, in order to maintain any sort of discussion, you have to think using the terms the way we would use it anyway. Because, like I say, things stored around long after, long after they're probably actually very useful. They hang around to confuse things for a long time after this. Um, but I, but I, I, I think right from my earliest, earliest dream, I did sort of tend to think that it's just been experience to try this from a thought process. The other thing, too, is that. So the institutions now, as institutions are spinning towards like the other sidelines rather than that's the only way they can deal with people like me. You know, not that they want it much if they can avoid it, but that's the only way they can do it on the whole. You can buy a product, you buy our products and stuff. Well, it, this also presents a really interesting um, separation of the way, at least in the, um, the way that artists strategize in the post conceptual context. And I think that having you guys in the panel today is a Really nice example of this, this particular approach to strategies where if we could say it in this very general way um, that Ian is perceived that you left the art world and that Liz you stayed in the art world and that Liz you're continuing to make art objects you know, that belong to the tradition of art making or say so paintings, videos, things that can be collected continue. And um uh Liz maybe interesting to just talk about why you choose to stay in the art world and, and, and to do that. Um, I don't see a means of escape necessarily. So um, I'm playing the game, I suppose. I'm doing what artists are meant to do. It's kind of a performance overall, um, filling the role that an artist feels in order to remain in the game, I guess, in order to retain a voice. As well, and then I try to negate that by talking about the end of art or theorizing art or having a discursive practice. To it's a wink of strategy, is how I describe <laughs> this, which is in line with that Italian philosopher Vachimo, I think it is, who describes postmodern strategies as, as essentially weak. I mean, in contrast to modern strategies, I think. So it's 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 really literally all I can come up with. But see, I've got to say that I'm still around the art world too. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and and my argument for it would be exactly the same as yeah, you know, yeah. like, I don't think there's something that 
In fact, I used to often cite this to people. Like, look at the Why did you give up the heart? Well, you you want some? You want to keep me here that if someone says they can no longer painting or participate, but you don't make paintings, it's this kind of resistance to the idea that someone else is deciding how you're performing as an artist or what categorizes your practice. Just go down. Well, I take regard situations as sort of design problems. And, and there was a situation in the late 90s, when I was in America, where the obviously the best solution was to paint the painting with exhibition of paintings, which I did. You know, and, um, because what else do you do when you're in Florida? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I couldn't, I wasn't independent in the society in any way at all, you know, but I could actually do these paintings, which they would take seriously because of paintings that provided a way of doing commentary on it. And so, so you do, you do. What's appropriate? I don't think you're limited to any of thing. But if you're not limited in the sense that you can go and just do policy documents, you're not limited in the sense you can also go and do papers. So that's the appropriate thing to do. But you see, I've developed a different feeling again about this too. I mean, I mean, as you know, I read, I read my Elizabeth's work, and I read more what she's done. And and yeah, but in a sense, they're a bit like um, I've got a place called Larry. Um, it's where Charles Darwin wrote the very first things Charles Darwin ever wrote about, about, about evolution. He actually wrote in 1836 in Wallera, right? <laughs> which makes the most important point place in Australia, I would point out. Yeah. Um, but what it did for him was he saw, saw insects and animals there, which are exactly the same as insects and animals he had seen in the UK or other, but they were totally different species, but they were exactly the same. And I regard a lot of the paintings as being totally different species that look exactly the same. As other ones, you know, because everything that brought them into being is different to what brought the other ones into being. You know, right? yeah. but, the, but the second big thing I make about that is originally I used to go on and on about, on about adaptation and innovation. I'm now much more interested in conservation right, in various ways. I mean, I've always been involved in heritage issues, but I'm conservation in the wider sense because. I've been um, thinking of um, UK is, um, yeah. oh, what's her name? Yeah, Layden. Layden, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've been, I wrote some stuff about her recently. I was reading a lot of the manifestos and things. And I mean, they are loaded in so many different ways. I mean, there's great stuff about feminism and the relationship between women's art and men's art, and stuff like that, and women's lives and men's lives. So, but, 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 you know, and then women's lives are about payments, basically, about looking after things and keeping things going and you know, doing the household. Um, and, and I actually thought that was a really strong, good analysis of stuff. But particularly because we're in the end times, you know, we need to preserve stuff as much as we need to adapt to innovate. We also need to preserve it, you know. And so I'm less keen to see things. Wiped out. Yeah. Oh, so preserve what? Well, all sorts of cultural forms, you know, and all sorts of cultural thinking. You need a huge number of, a lot of different forms of cultural thinking. You don't want to narrow it down. You just go to it. Oh, right. Okay. So, in terms of practice, uh, current practices, as many different types of practices oh, as possible. So, not yeah. just preserving what's already been made to this point, but preserving the practices. Yeah, so practices. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I mean, I touched on this a bit when I had a when I had a survey show in 2013, and what I did was the whole survey show was about remaking stuff, you know. And so what I did was remake my old work rather than and 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 I and I made these diagrams of how somebody else could remake it. Right? So the whole exhibition was an exhibition of these like extended, sort of extended interpretive panels, which were. How you could remake, how you could store this work and remake it at a future time. Here's the dimensions, here's the materials, here's the, you know, all that. And, and, and so I was sort of thinking towards that already, but I've been thinking about it a lot more since then. I was thinking this video about this idea that uh, Liz's practice certainly raises and also precedent for an exhibition that you proposed at the Art of New South Wales that was cancelled actually before it ever got up. Um, about this idea that if this institution is a problem, then the best place to antagonize it is from inside this institution itself. Um, so, um, 
Can you just talk about that, um, if you can, this, this exhibition that you're planning to produce at the Outdoor New South Wales? I mean, I think like the Sydney Biennale is coming up, very popular enough for Biennale to include other disciplines, architects, um, politics, social groups, permaculturists. Yeah, way, way back in 1975, when I was first thinking this stuff through, um, I started looking for other people who I thought were culturally significant outside of the art world. And I stumbled across this agriculturist called William Young's, who turned out to be phenomenal significant at the time. I mean, for instance, he was the forerunner of, of permaculture. Right? Permaculture was all based on his work, but, but his work in itself stands alone and is really significant different way of farming, especially in parts of Australia, uh, based on how you use water and how you and, and you know, he hadn't just gone and done this on farms, he'd actually trained people, he had his own magazine, he had, it was a whole media production house. Um, and and so I approached the out there and he said, well, I was last, and, then, and this was something which no one did in 1975. I was an artist who was going to curate the show, which artists didn't do in 1975. Um, and I was back to a show about someone who even himself didn't call himself an artist. You know, and yet I was going to do it like an exhibition where we were going to put up all the work um, with minimum interpretation, as there is the language you don't really know much about most paintings, just said all. So you just have to work this out yourself. You know? But when we, we had photos and we had all, well, just all sorts of ephemera. He also designed farm equipment, very specialist farm equipment, so we had his designs and sort of farm equipment. And it was all, and fortunately, Daniel Thomas uh, actually knew a bit about him through through um, Rick Wright, who was the son of the Big Nicholas, the painter, and their farm had been designed by the other one around the other principles. And so, so Daniel thought, yeah, this was actually a good idea. And it was a logical extension of sort of conceptual art, as he said at the time. You know? Uh, and so it was scared to always been to happen. Two or three months before, we had to have a little bit in the final stages of it. The trustees sort of went on, you know, sort of came down and released the exhibition to the other, what the hell is this? And one of the trustees also knew about T.A. Young's, he thought he was a radical rat bag, and insisted that the whole thing just be done. This is just an agricultural trade show. This is not art. What are we going to show this? And have it. And that was that. There was a little bit of a cause celebrity amongst, you know, curators and things like that that happened. And there was another sign of how bad things had put it out there in New South Wales. But anyway, that was the end of it. But in 2011, Lucas Ironway, who I adore, a country he he got invited to a show down at ACA, who had the influence of early, early conceptual art. He said, why don't we redo your exhibition? You know? And so we did this little summary version of it, of what was meant to be in it. And the art gallery actually lends us the minute book, the actual minute book, which had the trustees' arguments in it and stuff like that. And I found out all sorts of really interesting things, like that, that both the director and the deputy director had insisted that their opposition to the trustees be actually registered in the thing. So, so they stopped about it being cancelled and so on. And so this is sort of where they And then we got a message from the art gallery saying, well, maybe we made a mistake. <laughs> Would you like to apply again? <laughs> and so we put up the proposal and it happened in 2013. So we actually did the show. It looks like it was a joint show in 2013. The joke about this is when people say you're ahead of time, I actually know exactly how long. 38 years. I wasn't ahead of time. <laughs> so I feel, I mean, you know, some of my, my age, my generation, um, that would seem to me that uh, the persistence of conceptual strategies is hugely important to the art world. Um, if for nothing else, memory for someone to go back and read countless examples of when artists look back in history, overlooked artists who are currently doing it now in Australia as female artists. Um, and um, that, that there is, there is, there will be relevance in the future, you know, that we can never be in the future. Um, possibly what we do in the persistence or the persistence of our practices might be urgent. Um, in the future, even if they're not successful now. And something that uh, Liz and I have talked a lot about, um, Liz, I'd like to bring into this question about um, resisting from inside the system. Um, this idea from Slavoj Žižek of over identification with problems, something you call embodiment of a problem for art, um, uh, something that's uh, more broadly classified as subversive affirmation, but you're affirming the problem at the same time as you're criticizing it within art. Why, why that strategy? 
Um, <clears throat> so I guess Jujet uh, describes some um, direct opposition to a problem. So say if you're protesting um, <clears throat> capitalism, uh, he, he would say that that's a, the protest in itself is, is ineffective because it tends to, I don't know, an example I've seen is uh, maybe it's Coca-Cola or some other brand using a protest march in their advertising with um, the Kardashian chick in it. Like the, the, the system that is that powerful, such as capitalism, can easily override that kind of protest. Whereas when you attack a system from within, because at the same time, you might be in a protest march, we're all there, we're all on, on you know, against capitalism, but we've all got our phones and our shoes and whatever, you know, where it's, it's, it's a problem because we're all in the system already. So to, to oppose it is ineffective, whereas to attack it somehow from within the system by fully embodying its characteristics, somehow he frames that as a more effective way of fighting whatever it is you're up against. So in, in the event that giving up art isn't, a strategy, isn't an option or, or making an anti-art work, like a work that doesn't look like art, but I'm saying it is, that's not an option. I, I feel like this, as a strategy, it's more effective to embody what art is traditionally seen as or con what contemporary art specifically is. But also, I, I guess, while I do that, I try to um, embody the paradox that I see in, in post-conceptual art where it's the end of art, but art keeps going. So that's why I say the end of art, but I keep making it. So that's my embodiment. Can you do it as well? Yeah, see, I, I mean, I would keep chatting for Elizabeth now. I mean, I mean, I mean at various stages, people are somewhat ridiculously important yeah. outside her. I mean, I'm, you could be more of an insider. I mean, I was examining the best galleries and some of the ones sent in. And you know, everybody here was important and whatever, you know. I mean, the reason I got a lot of kickback institutionally and stuff later on is precisely because I was this creature that they had you know. so, so they weren't necessarily all that important. So then, boy, I sort of turned out 10 years later, you know. Um, you know, as the apostate rather than the outsider taking it. So. Um, we're kind of coming to the end of the talk because I've already, but, um, and I'd like to open to questions in a moment. But there is one thing I'd like to like to finish on as a kind of uh, uh, broad uh, uh, illustration of the trajectory that I've kind of perceived in sort of from conceptual to post conceptual art. There was to come back to Charlotte Day's exhibition Art as a Bird, which you participated in, and also wrote an essay on. Um, I had a conversation with Charlotte recently about this, and she brought to my attention a painting by Peter Tyndall that says, um, art is imaginative. I've been talking to Liz about this quite a lot, about this development from art as now to verb, possibly to adjective, ways just to describe or frame what, what we do and what we're doing. And I just wanted to kind of get both of your thoughts on that um, for your questions. I have a bit of an issue with it. Mm. I mean, it all does come down to definitions and words, and that's problematic to start with. But um, I like to deal with art as a noun, and I don't want to mess with it and turn it into a verb or an adjective or anything else. So that's kind of my view, but I'm coming from a position of ignorance about what how that was framed. I didn't get to read anything about it. So you might have more to say. Well, well they came to me with the proposition. So, <laughs> and, and, and quite honestly, I didn't care. You know, it's a noun, it's a verb, it's an adjective. <laughs> it's all of those. Um, and Donald Brock, I really, he was a great supporter of mine and a really good friend, you know, or whatever it was. And he just went to town, he got a whole essay, you know, no, it's not a verb. You know, right? um, um, but the thing was that I just don't think whether it's an ad or whatever actually matters, right? So much as the fact that it, it was discussed, the, uh, the essay in the exhibition was discussing a period where just the ground shifted, really, the flower people were. We're thinking about it. And the, the point that Donald made, which I think is even a more important one way, is that art's a homonym, you know, that it's a word which means actually five or six different things. And people sometimes, when they're talking about it, they mean two or three of them at the same time, or they mean one of them, and two people talking for years in totally different senses when talking to each other. 
And that's what results in so much of the bizarreness of the concept, the, the conversations in the debate. So, so <laughs> you're not actually talking about the same thing. Look, it's, it's, it's Darwin and adaptation and evolution again, you know, it's the same word, it's just not the same word. That's all. Um, well, I've got questions. Does anyone have any questions? Comments. Yes, Mark. Thanks, James. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Yeah. Look, I really enjoyed your conversation, but I was I was hungering the whole time to talk about a work in particular, and it struck me that the two of you together in this particular place is a really interesting combination. And I wanted to ask a question that's directed at both of you to kind of evoke some kind of relationality between the two of you. Because both of you have spoken about what you consider to be core and important about uh, practice or the way of being an artist. So the question is kind of half to Liz and half to Ian about how you look at each other. So Ian, you talk about the importance of uh, affecting some kind of social change. So I'm wondering if it's possible to bring that conversation down to, say, the artworks that are projected on the wall at the moment, how you might see that happening in a particular piece of Liz's work or that installation there. And Liz, I'm asking you at the same time how the fact that Ian's sitting next to you and your discussion about conceptual art and post-conceptual art, how a particular work of his might have helped you think through or get to that. And I guess the work that I know the best of Ian's, which I'm presuming is the best known work, is Walk This Line. Um, so. <laughs> is, is using this word yeah. the rights. Yeah. I laughed about that because I remember having a conversation with Ian once about the fact that when he's invited to do exhibitions these days, people are trying to exhibit his sculptures or paintings again, and they completely missed the point that he's not doing that anymore. You know, that these things are artifacts. And in fact, Liz and I had a similar conversation about that design in the survey exhibition. At what point are these um, artworks which is produced just artifacts now? Um, so it's, uh, I think it goes to the question also goes to the idea of uh, the difference in time between when you're making and reflecting on objects. A little bit, but. Yeah, yeah, I'll put this. I mean, look, I, right from when I first saw the this work, I mean, it was work I liked and I you know, always felt comfortable with it. And, and, and I think I understood right from the start pretty much what she was getting at with it, right? And, and, um, which is sort of seems to be confirmed by the things she drew this up. And I think I think what I've liked about it and I've liked about it since is the fact that this is something fairly rare in Australian art, which is someone who really does seriously think it's a good thing that you know, think stuff through. Well, it's not that this is you know unique, there are several Australian artists who like that, but but most of the time people are just reiterating stuff that came from somewhere else. You know? They're not actually thinking it through for themselves, not thinking it through things for themselves. And, and so that whole approach of, oh, well, you know, the art works about so and stuff. Here, I'll make stuff that, you know, you can sell. You know, where it's like, like just, yeah, yeah you want it there, take that. <laughs> it's, like, you know, it's something people buy. It works much more like it's sort of insulin conformity, you know, you've got to get away, you know. And so um, uh, that appeals to me greatly. Yeah. The thing about change is that change is the same thing. It doesn't necessarily mean any you know, political legislation or anything like that. It means change in the way people understand stuff. And that that change in understanding, which is the stuff that you know, I think is if somebody who creates that change is understanding is the person who what then defines an artist, you know, and 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 that understanding can be major or minor, it can be subtle, it can be, you know, it can be all sorts of different things, you know, like there are levels of it, it doesn't have to be something that brings the whole nation to a standstill, you know, like, and so, so there are all these different levels in which that stuff plays out, and so I don't have any problem with thinking of these in terms of that, that sort of definition that I have, and that approach that I have. Or an outcome. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and again, it's because you think of stuff, you think stuff through and reach and then you make it apparently more capable of thinking in a similar way of thinking through with you. Yeah, I try. But um similar I would 
works out so similarly, but Ian, mm -hmm. there's not a particular work of his that stands out to me as emblematic of what he does. It's his entire practice and the way he talks about work. <clears throat> it's his history um, and it's how he currently, you know, addresses the problem of being an artist in a post-conceptual moment that is what inspires me. So it's sort of, it's more like him as a person, if anything, than the work that, that I see as effective, perhaps. <laughs> so he's the embodiment of, of the problem. Of this of the problem. problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it back I think there's a, just to jump on that as well, someone who's not an artist, on the outside a little bit. When you're, I think when you're meeting an artist, one of the things I really like to get to very quickly is the motivation of why they make work. And if you can understand the motivation of why someone's practicing, I think that that practice becomes a lifelong, or that, that motivation becomes a lifelong pursuit. And when I think about the artists that I've had the privilege of working with, who had a long career already, people like John Nixon, who recently died, um, my hard work, I've had conversations with, they start to see their whole practice as one thing. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not about um, an object being kind of uh, having a singular identity, but, but, but belongs to an ecosystem of, of ideas and, and, and ways of working. Um, and uh, Liz has said the same, shared the same sentiment with me as well in the past. And um, so that's, that's kind of why during the conversation we've been talking more about strategy, you know, this idea that it's kind of what, what compels an artist actually to, to practice anyway. And it's something that I would also argue differentiates artists from non-artists is that you choose to be an artist and actually you can also choose to do absolutely nothing if, if you are an artist and that is a form of um of, of, of practice in itself um uh yeah does anyone else have any questions yeah. what's happening internationally um, Do you mean now? Yeah. On these issues. Yeah. On these issues. Mm. And what are they doing in response? Mm. Any positive movement? Mm. Um, an indirect um, tangent to your question is actually this idea of provincialism that goes actually hand in hand with um, when he had started making work in Australia, this idea that a lot of artists will come from overseas. This talks about it in their lives with the artist magazine when she gets to the Actually, a lot of artists who are staying here or thinking about those ideas who have thought of that as a problem. You know, why are all these artists going overseas doing things? Like, and actually, institutionally, why are we bringing people from overseas to show us how art should be done here at the same time? And um, Ian, you shared with me once that you deliberately stayed here. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I, I made, I, I would add at this point, there are times these days when I think it's a real mistake. Uh, I, I think I probably would have had a, a much better life and career overseas where they, in a sense, they had categories for people like me, you know, they were like, like public intellectuals and artists, you know, all sort of like rolled up together and public breakfast all rolled together. It's not an unusual thing, whereas in Australia it is a really unusual thing. People have never known quite how to deal with me, I don't think. You know, that's always been part of the problem. But, but, but having said that, yes, I know I made, I made just contrary conscious decision to study here because most of the things I really wanted to do were to do with here. And I, 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 to the degree I thought about provincialism, I just thought, well, the, the way about provincialism is just to do, is to be where you are and do what you're doing there. And if that has every everywhere, there are things happening in every single place that have universal application in some way or another. And provincialism, as it's usually defined, is actually really an issue about colonialism and centers of power and stuff like that. And the best way you can find that is just by refusing to be in the fight, you know, by refusing to, to to take part in it, right? Um, so I don't think any of that ever ever sort of stopped me. Doing um, well, having said that, um, I ended up in Australia while getting very little support because because it is a is a real separate colonial country and everything's interpreted in terms of what's happening somewhere else, and no one can find someone like me somewhere else to just sort of categorise me um, until much much later. 
in wars. I didn't get support. I didn't get resources. I could have done a huge amount more, you know, if, if that was possible. But so and so, I, I lost out on lots of things like that. It's just the way it was. I think um, um, it depends on the paradox you're talking about. Probably is one area, but perhaps one of the greatest paradoxes for uh, contemporary art is this idea of um, globalization and regional specificity. And um, and I think that uh, one of the people that dealt with that very sensitively was like Wayne Weiser. He had multiple epicenter Vietnamese. Um, there's probably lots of examples of exhibitions. There was um, Jamana Chalan before he died. Um, uh, restaged Harold Seaman's um, exhibition not so long ago. So we're seeing also. Um, a rise in the restaging of exhibitions and how you can accurately do them uh, as well. So perhaps we visit this is goes to this idea of anti-novel or the anti-new and I think that's a paradox as well for contemporary art. Um Liz, do you want to add anything to that? I don't feel like I don't uh, travel enough or know enough about what is happening in being globally to comment, but I try to keep up with the theory, I guess. And um it feels like things are in a bit of a stance in a way, like there are conferences about crisis in art or what's next, like asking these questions that have been asked maybe for a long time. Like, so, I don't know, do you think there's a stasis? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, it, but there's also other, other things. Like, it's like there's this constraint of what we're doing. Um, um, I, I, I've taken over one of this is projects for a year. Which is Lives of the Artist, which she stopped doing in, back in 2004. So for one year or so, I'm going to redo it. I'm going to remake it. But, and I'm basically using her general model and her approach. But but again, this fits in that thing where I say about conserving things and, and remaking and stuff like that. But 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 I'm not exactly using her approach because my friends, at least half of them in a sense, are overseas I've never met them and they exist in social media. So what I'm doing is interviewing people that I only know through social media. The other way actually reading them up and talking to them and interviewing them. I've never met half of them face to face ever. Yeah. And and that that breaks up the whole international thing in some ways. I mean you know you don't know their society, you don't even know, you don't know their contents and stuff, but you do actually have much more direct access to people than you than you did back then. But although having said that too, around 1970, I was corresponding with people in New York all the time. So it's very uh, maybe tying together. I wonder. I don't know what my question is, but I suppose the point that really struck me was James and William said about the problem that Liz raised about escaping or that we can't escape. And you made a, a small comment about perhaps the self reflection or self reflection and sharing is what the institution. Cannot own mm. or cannot um, occupy, mm. um, and perhaps that relates somehow to this other question of globalization. And it made me think of a paper that was in that Dark Eden conference that you presented at Leeds by Louis Mason, mm -hmm. uh, Australian theorist that was living overseas, and he gave a paper critiquing modernism and that. Um, whole idea of pulling apart and revealing the institutionalization and um, creating transparency around power and mm -hmm. nation and all mm -hmm. those things that mm -hmm. we kind of went through and, and he proposed another model where he was kind of advocating for opaque forms of small group love, mm -hmm. which I thought was really mm -hmm. um, interesting and I'm wondering whether these kinds of Projects are kind of coming back to that. Yeah, I, I don't know what I I'm think, saying. I think, look, I think what Ian's extension of this is like, yeah, one thing that's makes me seem the most concrete um, example that I can attach to your question is that um, what I like to refer to as kind of, you look, everyone looks at their CVs and all these jobs, these things that you did, these exhibitions, you did these. But, I mean, that, that, they're the jobs, but what the connective tissue. That keeps you together or keeps you in what you're doing is the uh, the informal conversations that are happening all the time, the gossiping, the networking, all these kinds of things. And I think uh, what Life of the Artist did really well was formalize that or at least give us a record of, of the problems that are being faced by artists. And, and I think that's probably something that the institutions can't ever um, subjugate. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
the other thing that's happened in my lifetime, too, really, really conspicuously, is that is that artist collaboration barely existed at the start of my well, there were the occasional things like that. When when our language came along, it was like, oh my god, you know, it's a group of artists, you know. Um and and that was so rare. It was really rare. And then now I don't think I, I, I do the things on my own, but basically I work in something like the three or four entirely different you know, collaborations and groups of like with one or two people or Kennel School of Cultural Adaptation is 16 of us. You know, I mean, it just varies, you know. So you can see that you can bring together these sort of groups that, that tackle particular issues or the sense of interest. But I suppose what the problem it doesn't take away that problem that someone like the is working on for a practitioner that wants to make work. Like, what does work look like? Mm. I don't know whether we can mm. say that, but what does work become that is contending with those kinds of contingencies that we're talking about? Well, I think it becomes partly what the interpractice has mm. become. Mm. Um, and this is the, this is the Opportunity to see the divergence of post conceptual practices right here, you know, mm -hmm. at, least, at least in Australia. The so KSCA makes things in a way often very big physical things, you know, in particular, you know, like we, you know, we put on big weekend symposiums with farmers and we do, you know, we do actually, you know, have things where we do hydrology things and have development, for instance, where we get people really making it. Making farm, basically, basically make things to mock creeks, you know, to, to build up to hydrate the landscape or something. Like they're, they're teaching things and they're, you know, they're, so they are physical things in that sense. And they're made with a mixture of people, some of them are artists and some of them are not. So, what arm of conceptual art is your practice, which is quite different to um, this is conceptual practice related to relational perception? Um, I was thought relational aesthetics is one of the institution's multiple attempts to, to break in the rebelliousness, you know, with conceptual art, right? I mean, as conceptual art became social and community, type, type, type of community practices that were happening outside the institutions, that had started to dawn on the institutions that they were missing out on this somehow. They had to invent rationales, you know, names and labels and whatever. And the people who got called, who got wrapped in under relational aesthetics were useless. You know, they were really feeble parodies of the real stuff that was actually happening out there, you know. But I mean, I mean, Tino Cigar, I just think, oh, you know, please give it a you know. I mean, seriously, you know. I mean, it's just, it's just utterly useless, you know. And and um, what's her name? Um, the woman uh, who has the new bolt. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Again, you know, this 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 is just a sort of parody of stuff, you know. And so it actually demonstrates the bankruptcy of the institutions as they tried to capture this thing that had run away from them. You know, they had to rope it back and create this tiny sort of fake version of it. You know, and I, I just think it was the, the, the sort of theory around it always sounded all right, right, all right, but the examples I used, like people like that, were just hopeless. Yeah. Um, Liam, so Liam. On, that, on that positive note, <laughs> um, I want to really thank Ian, especially for coming and talking to us tonight today. Thank you all for coming as well in the terrible weather. And, um, and thanks to this as well. And um, uh, like I said, if you haven't seen it, please go and see this is show. It's on until the 10th of April. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you.